Hello there, good afternoon to you. If you're just joining us here at LBC, we've spoken a couple of times over the years, haven't we, a few times over the years, about the mental health of students in our universities and colleges and the degree to which, two two things really, the degree to which the universities themselves uh, should be responsible, the, the, the level of responsibility that universities should have for, you know, new adults really. You know, if we're looking at the typical age of going to college of 18... Um, that's very young. I know when I started at 18, I, I, I was still a kid, really. You know, I still needed support. And, and the, the university I went to is still a collegiate system. And it, I, I think, it, certainly in my day, it had very good pastoral support. Um, but there's that element. And there's also the element of, uh, yes, they're 18 and yes, they're adults. But if, if a, a young person at uni has, um, uh, you know, a severe... Uh, a health problem of any kind, really, but especially a mental health problem. Um, should parents be in that loop? I mean, again, it depends on the family situation. My instinct is that they should be in that loop. And again, I know that the child in question or the young person in question uh, is legally an adult, so can say, no, I don't want you to contact my parents. And, and that does put the university in a difficult position. But I, I'm just keen to know your own experiences for a start. And also where you think the university's level of responsibility begins and ends when it comes to the young people in their care, in their in their colleges. Is it in their care? Should there be more care, more active care for, for students? Um, one woman who absolutely thinks there should be is Hilary Grime, um, a, a woman whose daughter, Phoebe, took her own life at the age of 20 back in 2021 while studying at Newcastle University. Uh, she's campaigning for universities to have a statutory legal duty of care for students. Uh, and we're also joined by Robert and Margaret Abrahart, uh, parents whose daughter Natasha took her life again at the age of 20 while studying at the University of Bristol back in 2018. Good afternoon to all three of you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And my sympathies to all three of you to start with for what you've been through. And, and again, to campaign about it, it is about others really, isn't it? Uh, Hilary, you're, you're desperate for others not to go through what you did. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, every parent's worst nightmare. Um, and of course, everyone thinks it's uh, never going to happen to them. Um, but it does happen. One uh, student takes their life every uh, four or five days in this country. It's not something that is is broadcast or, or known about because obviously the universities uh, want that hushed up. But um, it's 100 families a year you know, that are affected by uh, the suicide of their children at uni. And it's uh, it's really, it's got to stop. It's absolutely what, got to stop. It's, what it's what makes you say the universities want it hushed up? Um, it's not recorded. Um, there's no record of it. Like if you wanted to know how many people took their life, how many students took their life at any university, you you know, you would you would never find that. Um, it's, it's really difficult information to put your hands on um you know it's not in newspapers and things it's only really parents that are trying to speak out but it's it's a task these are massive institutions that we're we're fighting against and um i sort of think my only qualification to do this is um you know i'm just a mother <laughs> and that's well, that's all i am well, there's, but, no, there's um, no just about that is there um t tell me what <laughs> happened then in, in phoebe's case i know i noticed attached to your campaign for this petition is a, a lovely photograph of the two of you that was taken really a short while before she took her life. Yeah, um, I mean, I was sort of, uh, I call it a gift without wanting to go into too much detail. It was a sort of gift Phoebe gave me. I did go and stay in Newcastle and actually stayed in her student accommodation um, two weeks before we died and before she died. And she, we had this amazing, uh, really, really special uh, weekend together, which I um, hold uh, very, very close dear. to my heart. Yeah. But um, I didn't realise, I knew Phoebe wasn't happy. I knew COVID had had a huge impact on her. Um, she had other problems. So her father was uh, diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer in April. The photo that you can see was taken uh, May the 20th. She took her life on um, June the 5th. So um, she had a lot of... Uh, um, sort of problems going on a but, lot building uh, inside but a huge build huge build up of everything and 
I think sort of the problem is, which Annie really realised after she died, is that, um, you know, she told me that she was in touch with the university and that she was having counselling. And if you look on uh, Newcastle particularly, um, it says that on their mental health timeline that their priority is the safety and well-being of their students. So you're sort of trusting them that they're doing the right thing and the, and the best thing. Um, but actually, for me, it, it transpires that didn't happen. Um, because, as, as I said, they had my phone number, um, but they didn't ring me, and they knew um, they should. They should have. Yeah. And, and and she was confiding in them how intense her feelings were becoming. Was she? In, yeah. In those... So um, incredibly, again, after she died, uh, Newcastle actually kept a, a really detailed mental health timeline, which is really impressive. It's uh, it's ninety three pages of every time Phoebe contacted them and the counselling sessions, and um, you know, in that I did see um, in. Not- October 2020, she told them that she'd had um, a plan to take her life involving uh, paracetamol. So um, they did. And you knew nothing about that? No, I knew nothing. Um, they also have in their timeline that I rang them um, and that they had my number and that they would contact me. Um, so, and I had no idea that it was um, a serious Phoebe had ever, ever had any of those um, and, thoughts. And let me bring in Robert and Margaret Abrahart, whose daughter Natasha took her life in 2018 at the age of 20. Um, are, there, are there similarities in your story? There are some similarities, but um, we've just uh, been through a four-year court battle, as you may be aware, with the University of Bristol. And in Natasha's case, um, the university was found guilty of causing her death by not doing what they should have done. What didn't they do? Well, Natasha had a certain disability, social anxiety disorder, and they made no allowances whatsoever for it. In fact, what they did was was to continually mark her down or fail at her. And in in the end, the day she died was the day she was expected to do some sort of presentation in a 350-seat lecture theatre, which was beyond her capability. Mm. So she had the intellect, uh, but not necessarily all of the, the personal elements of being able to deliver a a, a lecture like that? Well, Natasha actually um, struggled with one-on-one interviews. She'd been struggling for six months with one-on-one interviews and they knew she couldn't do it. And for that, they were failing her and she was in danger of being kicked off the course and still they didn't do anything. And were you, um, Margaret, come in on this, Were were you aware of how she just kept being asked and asked and asked to do stuff that they knew would send her into anxiety? We were aware that she was depressed. We'd found out um, the Easter before she went back uh, and that she was behind. And she told us that she was talking to the university and that they were finding a solution. She, she made no mention whatsoever of the oral assessments, which is perhaps not surprising because that's one of the things with social anxiety disorder is that you tend not to want to talk about it. Mm. I think what really shocked us afterwards was when we looked at what the university knew about her, that they hadn't done more to specifically tackle that difficulty. They seemed to be waiting to see what happened. And there was no attempt to make what happened. No attempt to make what we call a reasonable adjustment for somebody with whatever particular consideration is needed. Uh, that was what the court found was that they failed to make reasonable adjustments and they certainly had enough information to be in order to do that they they kept trying to follow a process which wasn't which she wasn't able to follow and almost using that as an excuse she's not filled in the right bit of paperwork so we won't make any changes well common sense would have told you that she wasn't able to manage that process mm. so they'd been waiting months for it and and she was conscientious and in all other aspects of her work you know she was doing her exam she was doing her her written work that didn't require all elements uh, so I it mean, should have I, been clear to them I mean even without I, I didn't have any of that social anxiety but always those oral exams or those one-on-one tutorials where you as much as anything else you know the, the, there's nowhere to hide is there you absolutely have to deliver Add to the, so what I'm saying is they're nerve-wracking anyway. Add to that a social anxiety disorder and it must have been incredibly difficult for her. 